Wednesday. All right, we're getting started with a question. And the question is, have you guys ever been guilty of not paying enough attention to those, like the fine print when maybe you're signing a contract for just basic services? Or, or maybe you've just clicked the box and said, yes, I have read the terms of service and you have not actually read the terms of service. Anyone ever do that? Okay, so you should be careful with this one because back in 2017, uh, 22,000 people in the UK signed up for free Wi-Fi and they did not pay attention to the fine print because when they signed up for this free Wi-Fi and agreed to the terms of services, they also agreed to 1,000 hours of community service. And in the fine print, it specified toilet cleaning. And again, in the fine print, uh, unclogging sewage blockages. <laughs> Thousand hours of this stuff. Now, fortunately for them, this was one of those kind of pranks, kind of not pranks. They didn't actually have to dedicate a thousand hours. It was a warning, pay attention to what you're agreeing to before you agree to it. Uh, but most of you probably have Facebook or Instagram or some other you know, apps on your phone. Have you read? Have you read all the fine print? when you actually say yes to having that app on your phone? Probably not, but some of you know if you said yes to having Facebook, you actually said yes to allowing them to change anything that you post or using your images however they want to. Um, you've said yes to Instagram. They have the uh, clause in there that they can edit, they can actually doctor um, any image or uh, any, any uh, post that you make. Now, hopefully, if they're changing anything, they're just making us look prettier than we actually are. Uh, but they have access to do that. Um, in fact, if you were on Spotify, they were in um, kind of uh, hot water uh, a couple years ago when they mandated that they have access to any of your stored information on your phone. Like, wait, 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 any of the like, stored information on my phone, you have access to it? Now, don't even get me started on TikTok because I'll just sound like a conspiracy theorist. But as a Chinese-owned company, here's the thing. Some of you got really bent out of shape when it came to that spy balloon. It's like, oh my gosh, what are these guys doing? Guys, that's like James Bond trying to gather intel with a can and a string. Like, that's, that's the equivalent of what they were able to get on us compared to what TikTok has available if you have that app. But... Our national security aside, have you, ever, have you ever not paid attention to the fine print and ran into problems? Maybe because you didn't pay attention to wording like introductory offer, phrases like deferred interest, non-refundable. How about the automatic renewal? You ever had gotten burned on that one? As a 20-year-old, I was like, why am I still paying for a service I don't need anymore? Oh, automatic renewal. I, get a, I better stop that, right? So why are we talking about fine print? Because if you've ever, ever had one of those experiences, you know how discouraging and annoying it is when you think you've got a product, you think you've got the service, and it's going to deliver one thing, and then it's like as though they just kind of pull the rug out from underneath you, and you're like, wait, 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 this is, this is not what I signed up for. And it's frustrating. And as Christians, you need to be aware that there is fine print when it comes to following Christ. There is fine print when it comes to actually walking out your faith as a Christian. Let me tell you some of the fine print. Very specifically, the fine print says if you're going to be Christ-centered in your life, if you're going to have a Christ-centered home, you will experience persecution. Like, that's a fine print that a lot of people just either ignore, they just kind of gloss over, or it's never actually shared with them. If you are a follower of Christ, you will experience persecution. If you have gone through our Encountering Grace study, some of you are like, yeah, 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 I know this. Because we actually cover this. The Encountering Grace study is for those who uh, need to walk through what the gospel, the good news of Jesus is, what it looks like to put your faith in Christ, uh, what it actually looks like to walk out your Christian faith. And so in that study, we have a list of these blessings, these promises of God when you put your faith in him. And so this is not the exhausted list, but I'll give you an example of what these are. So you put your faith in Jesus and you get all these wonderful blessings, life to the full, fruit of the spirit growing inside of you, forgiveness of sin. These are all really, really great blessings. You guys see the last one on the list? What is it? Persecution. Why do we add this? Because we want people to be aware of the fine print. And if it's a deal breaker for you, like, okay, you know, uh, all those other things are really cool, but I don't really want to deal with this, you need to be aware that this is actually something that's going to happen in your life. Let's go ahead and read that verse. It's found in 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to read to you verse 12. It says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, I think that's a lot of us, if not all of us, if anyone wants to live that godly life in Christ Jesus, you got to expect something, that you will be what? You're going to be persecuted. 
And I think for many of you, it's, it's an idea, you know, there, there, there's an idea that, yeah, 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 you know, persecution is out there, uh, but maybe, maybe I can fly under the radar. Maybe, maybe because I live in the United States, you know, it won't be that big of a deal. I don't know if you're familiar with the organization called Open Door Ministry, but for decades, Open Doors has been highlighting persecution of Christians around the world globally. And so some of you know that that exists in our world, uh, but they came up with a, they come up every single year with the top 50 countries where persecution is the highest. And uh, they came up with a video for 2023 highlighting the top 10. So just to kind of gain a perspective on Christian global persecution, let's watch this video. Over 360 million Christians around the world face persecution and discrimination every day. And these are the top 10 countries where Christians risk everything for Christ. Number 10, Sudan. Unrest in Sudan has increased following a military coup. Violence and pressure against Christians have worsened. At number nine, Afghanistan. Following the Taliban takeover, those Christians who have not fled the country have been forced deep underground. If discovered, they face death. Iran is at number eight. Iranian house churches are seen as a threat by the Islamist regime. Church members who are caught are given long prison sentences. Number seven, Pakistan. Pakistan's infamous blasphemy laws are often used to target believers. Christian women and girls are vulnerable to kidnap and forced marriage. Nigeria is at number six. More Christians are killed in Nigeria than in all the other countries of the world combined. And the violence is getting worse. Number five, Libya. In this lawless land, both native and migrant Christians are targeted, kidnapped, and even killed. At number four is Eritrea. Christians who dare to meet without official permission risk arrest. Over a thousand believers are in jail without charge. Yemen is number three on the list. The humanitarian crisis continues. Anyone suspected of being a Christian will be deliberately overlooked for aid and might be expelled or killed by their own tribe. Number two is Somalia. Islamic militants are intensifying their hunt for Christians and violent attacks are increasing. And at number one, North Korea, the most dangerous place in the world to be a Christian. Spies are everywhere. Discovery means death, either by execution or by being worked to death in a labor camp. Despite the danger, in all these countries, the church is not defeated. It is living, powerful, defiant. All right, so did you guys notice that the United States was not on that list? You guys catch that? Yeah, we weren't even on the top 50. And I think if we were on the top 50, I think most of us would be like, really? I'm a little surprised by that. Imagine, though, for a moment that we are one of those countries, that we're on that top 10 because persecution is really high. You know what I think we'd probably see? I think we'd probably see a lot of people who claim the name of Christian, probably not claiming it quite so strongly, maybe backpedaling on it just a little bit. Because we've talked about this in the series every single week, that there's a big difference between being a Christian and actually being Christ-centered. That we can claim Christianity, but then we can live as though Christ doesn't actually exist. That God isn't the one who is driving, moving our lives. But what does it mean to be Christ-centered? It means that Jesus is not just one part of your life, he is the center of your life. And so in this series, we've been trying to look at some of the, uh, some of the blessings that Jesus has for us. And, and these are all, um, they all come from qualities and characteristics that are actually lived out in Jesus. And we've been applying this directly to our homes and saying, okay, these are wonderful blessings that if we live out these qualities, well, then our homes will actually experience blessing. And I think all of us want a home that is blessed. And so today we're going to be looking at uh, really the last one but it's not the last one we're gonna look at. Next week, we're gonna finish up the series, but I've intentionally skipped one, and then we're gonna get back to it next week. But if you don't mind, turning to Matthew chapter five, we're gonna read uh, the last of these blessings. Verse 10, and you guys probably already know where it's going based on the intro here, but it says, blessed 
Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Not persecuted because you're a jerk, but persecuted because you are having right living, God-honoring, holy living. Blessed are you if you are persecuted because of righteousness. And then here's the reward. For there is, so excuse me, uh, because of righteousness, for there is, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you're going to be Christ-centered, you are going to experience some level of persecution. And I know when you compare what you might experience here in the United States, it might not be as intense as some of the countries that we just witnessed, but you will experience it. I remember the very first time that I had at least a small taste of persecution. It came when I was in middle school. Let me just emphasize, it was a small taste of persecution. Uh, I grew up in a Christian home where we wanted to honor God with what we did and what we said and how we thought. That's just, that's just what we did as a, as a family. And I remember going into middle school. If you remember middle school, you probably remember you were trying to push the boundaries a little bit. Like every middle schooler is trying to push the boundaries a little bit, and I was certainly no exception. But one of the areas where I just, I just never even felt compelled to push the boundaries was when it came to language, uh, at least when it came to using God's name as a curse word. That was just so dishonoring in my mind. I was like, whoa, why would you ever dishonor God by using his name as a curse word? And so I had friends that were pushing that boundary, and there was a sense of me in, in me that just want to kind of help guide them to not do that anymore, particularly those of those my friends who I thought had a, at least a Christian leaning. And so here's what I'd do. They would say God as a curse word, and I'd say, oh, did you mean gosh? You probably meant gosh, right? Yeah. Okay. And that was just my, my gentle way of saying, hey, let's honor God. Let's honor God and not use his name as a curse word. They would say Jesus, like as a curse word. Like, oh, you meant Jesus, right? Did you mean Jesus? Yeah, okay. And most of my friends were like, oh, yeah, my bad, my bad, Jonathan. Yeah, yeah, no, gosh, gosh is what I meant. Oh, yeah, Jesus, Jesus is what I meant. Um, but then I'd have other friends. They'd be like, no, I meant God, and I meant it. And I also mean bleep, 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 bleep. And it's like, whoa, okay, that backfired. <laughs> You're going to hell. Sorry, that's just, <laughs> that's what's happening now. Um, but I actually gained a nickname. I gained a nickname, and at the time, I did not like this nickname. In fact, even now, it's like, oh, gosh. They called me the language police. <laughs> I would enter conversations, and no kidding, kids would like look at me like, oh, here comes the language police. And I'd say, oh, did you mean gosh? Thanks, language police. Like, I, I gained this reputation of being known as the language police. Here's the thing. As a middle schooler who wants to fit in, just like every middle schooler wants to fit in, I realized I was not fitting in if I was going to try to honor God in this way. Now, I'm not saying my strategy was perfect. (laughs) It may not have been helpful just to, like, try to correct people. But it came from this heart of, hey, I want to honor God with how I communicate about him and for him. And I know that these guys at least have a Christian leaning, and I think they want to honor God, too. So let me just try to, you know, redirect them. And I received just a tiny dose of persecution. Now, again, it was really minor, but this is what happens. This is what happens in our lives when we decide, you know, we're going to live a righteous, holy life. There is going to be pushback that takes place. Jesus goes on to explain it further. Verse 11, he says, blessed are you when people insult you. You're going to receive insults. Blessed are you when you're persecuted and falsely, and people say all uh, false things, excuse me, uh, let me try that again, persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. You might actually, if you're walking with Christ, you actually might have slanderous words spoken against you. How are we supposed to respond to this? Rejoice and be glad. We're going to talk about this in a moment. Because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who came before you. So how might this play itself out in your life, right? There's a sense of, as Christians, we know Jesus makes our life better, right? Like all of us know, Jesus makes our lives better and makes us better at life. At the same time, according to what Jesus is just saying, it actually might make your life a little harder, too. How could this play itself out in your day-to-day? I know that we've got students here today, and maybe you take a stand when it comes to, you know, purity in relationships, or you're single, and you take a stand when it comes to God's call of purity. What's going to happen is you're going to take some heat for that. In fact, some of you have. If if you make a decision as a young person to say, okay, you know what, I'm going to honor God and I'm going to honor my future spouse by not engaging in some of the sexual activity that is so common in relationships these days, you're probably going to want to date somebody and they're not going to get that. And they'll look at you like, whoa, what? You're trying to keep what from us and our relationship? 
Uh, or maybe they'll make fun of you. They'll, they'll minimize that decision and try to coax you. You're going to experience a bit of that. Or maybe you're a young person that wants to take it to another level. And you think to yourself, okay, here's the deal. I, I want to honor God. And there's so many temptations that come with a relationship, a romantic relationship. And I want to honor my future spouse. And I don't want to bring any of that into our future relationship. You know what I need to do? Maybe I just, maybe I just need to not date until marriage is a real possibility so that I can limit all that distraction and I can eliminate that temptation. What's going to happen? People are going to be funny because that's just not what people do in our culture. But your stand for righteousness and holiness will receive some pushback. Maybe you're a parent and you decide, you know what, uh, let's not be a part of those extracurriculars because every single time we get involved in those extracurricular activities, it just takes us away from it takes away from the church, and it takes away from Christian community. And so let's just, let's just not involve ourselves in those extracurricular activities at this time in, in our lives. You think other parents are going to get that? No, they're going to say, wait, why are, you, why are you taking this wonderful opportunity away from your kid? Well, actually, we're giving them a wonderful opportunity to grow in the relationship with God in the church. That's what we're doing. Oh, okay. Oh, I get it. And, and, and you know, just by the looks that they're giving you, by the whispers that are, they don't get it, and they think it's a little weird, and you, you're like that strange Christian family now. Uh, maybe in your workplace, you take the moral high ground on an issue. You, you, take, you take an ethical high ground, and you recognize that certain things that everyone else is justifying in order to make money isn't really right, and so you just come out and say, I think that's wrong. I don't know if I can be a part of that. You don't think you're going to experience a little bit of persecution for that? At the minimum, you're not going to be a part of the inner circle anymore. Minimum. You might actually prevent yourself from upward movement in the company. You might actually even be fired. So if persecution is a reality for those families, those homes that choose to be Christ-centered, let me give you some suggestions to prepare your family well, to prepare your home well. I'm going to share three ideas with you. First idea is this. Let's teach our family to expect persecution. Let's teach our family to expect persecution. Have you noticed that it's really nice when people tell you what to expect? You can like prepare yourself, mentally prepare yourself for things. Uh, maybe you're visiting a friend and you say, hey, hey, you know what? I'm not really sure what to wear when I'm visiting you in February. What is the weather like? And they tell you, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're going to need to wear a coat. I mean, you need to layer up. It's going to be freezing. Isn't it nice when they tell you what to expect? Then you can come not with your shorts and your tank top and freeze to death. Um, what about spicy food? Uh, I know some of you like spicy food, and so this wouldn't be a big deal. But have you ever had someone say, oh, oh, hey, by the way, before you dig into that, it, it's on the spicy side. So you didn't just go and like burn your face off. And you're like, oh, yeah, ooh, yeah, no, that's pretty. Like, it's nice. It's nice when people tell you what to expect. Or, hey, if you turn on my street, uh, you know, make sure you slow down because there's always kids playing on my street, whether it's kickball or football. So just when you turn on my street, just slow down and you turn on the street like, oh my gosh, there's like 50 kids. I would have ran over like 10 of them if I hadn't have been like, you know, it's nice. It's nice to know what to expect. What is Jesus doing? He's trying to tell you what to expect. He's, he's trying to prepare you and he's trying to prepare your family. You're going to experience persecution. And so how can we prepare for that? I think one of the best things that we can do is actually introduce ourselves. You know, if you're just living in, in your own home, you're single, prepare yourself. If you're a parent, certainly prepare your kids for that. How? By introducing yourself and your kids to small, low doses of persecution. How can you do that? Let me give you some examples. So let's say it's Thanksgiving, and you're inviting the extended family over, and not all of them are Christians. You can sit down with your kids, and you can say, hey, all right, so you know um, it's going to be Thanksgiving, and we're a Christ-centered home. So you know what we're going to do. We're going to pray before the meal. And, and a part of that prayer and a part of the conversation is just going to be about how good God is for not only providing the food, but blessing us throughout the year. But don't forget, we're inviting Uncle So-and-So, and we're inviting Grandpa. And you know we love them very, very much, but they don't love God right now. And so we don't know what they're going to say and how they're going to respond to us you know, honoring God. So just be prepared for that. What are you doing? You're, you're introducing, you're preparing them for these small, low doses of persecution. And I can share this one because it's actually played itself out in our family. You know, we've sat down and we've told our kids, and sure enough, like at prayer time, we've got a few of the family members who are actually kind of making like quiet jokes at everyone's expense, and they're just talking over the prayer. What has this led my boys to do? They pray on a regular basis now for their extended family who don't know Christ. 
but you're introducing that a little bit at a time. I don't pay attention to fashion, so you ladies, you can tell me that I'm like clueless, but uh, are, are yoga pants, I don't even know what they call them yoga pants anymore, stretch pants, whatever. You know what I'm talking about. Are they cool anymore? Is like that still cool? Okay, it, it, what I'm a little disturbed by is Ben, Ben is shaking his head. Yeah, yeah, they're cool, they're cool. So the, the fashion guru here is Ben, and he says, yeah, they're cool. <laughs> uh, so here's the thing, I, I, they may or may not be cool, Ben may or may not be right, but I remember a few years ago, uh, there was this group of parents who made some comment that basically was like, oh, hey, Jonathan, you have all boys, so lucky you, you never have to have the yoga pants conversation. Like, what? I don't even know what you're talking about. Yoga pants conversation? What is a yoga pant? I, I didn't know. Uh, and, and then they went on to explain how they've had to sit down with their young girls and talk about, you know, modesty. Because if you know anything about stretch pants, it doesn't leave a whole lot to the imagination. And so they had to sit down with their girls and say, okay, as a Christ center home, this is what's fashionable, but is it God honoring? This is fashionable. But is this modest? And they had to have these conversations and come to a conclusion of, okay, if you wear this, is there a way to wear it in a way that's actually still, you know, modest? And maybe it's a long t-shirt, but if it's a long t-shirt and that's not that cute way to wear the pants, you got to know that other friends of yours might actually tease you and make fun of you for not wearing it the right way. And what are they doing? They're introducing this preparation. Because we're Christ-centered, because we're going to honor God, even with what we wear, you actually might be different. You might stand out. So be prepared. I know of a, a family, and I, hopefully this is true of all of our families, they wanted to make the study of God's word a priority in their family. And so what they did was they decided not to just study God's word in the home, but also study it wherever God had them go. So mom and dad, they had to go to work, and they told their kids, we're going to be studying God's word at work. When it's appropriate, at lunchtime, we're going to open up our Bibles, we're going to read it, we're going to study it, and if you're up for it, when you have open reading time at school, you can study God's Word right there. And not only will you be able to read God's Word, but it might be an opportunity to actually have a conversation with someone else about spiritual things because you've got your Bible. But understand, it might be a little weird, and some people may actually look at you a little funny. One of the students that I worked with did this with his, his folks, and he gained a reputation. He actually gained a nickname similar to mine. His was Church Boy. They started calling him Church Boy. All his friends were like, oh, Church Boy over here is reading his Bible. Man, what a nerd. And it was just like that became his little nickname. And imagine in high school, you're like a freshman, sophomore in high school, you're called Church Boy. Created just a little bit of insecurity for about a week. And then he just decided to own it. He's like, yeah, I'm Church Boy. And the reason I'm church boy is because church is awesome. And I would say, you need to come to church with me. Tuesday night, youth group is amazing. You can come. And sure enough, multiple of his friends came to youth group. And I was actually able to baptize one of them in Christ. Because what did he do? He decided, I'm going to be weird. I'm going to be different. I'm going to be Christ-centered. And I'm going to actually read and study the God's word, even in spite of a negative, a negative name. This is what we do. We, we introduce as a family, hey, if we're going to be Christ-centered, there might be persecution. In the United States, most of it will probably be low-level persecution, but it's there all the same. But we can still see how God will use it in amazing ways. Number two, number two, not only do we introduce this fact that this is going to happen, number two, we teach our families to endure persecution. We teach our families to endure persecution. In second, excuse me, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12, the Apostle Paul writes this, excuse me, verse 12 says this. It says, we work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, what do we decide to do? We decide to bless people. When we are persecuted, we what? You endure it. We endure it. We don't do what these guys do. Let's watch. I mean, choosing to live for God, there's, there's consequences no one tells you about. The first time I realized I was under persecution was June of 2017. I walked into church and it was, it was freezing. I asked them what the temperature was and they said it was 71. I asked them to raise it up to something a little warmer and they wouldn't. <laughs> Sorry. Ugh. I remember walking into the sanctuary um, on a Sunday morning and uh, 
some family, some family, some stupid family uh, was sitting in my spot, the spot I've been sitting in for years. And so I had to, I looked around, I had to find some other spot. I had to sit in some other chair, it was awful. And then just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, um, I was handed uh, communion bread. And it was stale, it was awful. It tasted like cardboard. And I look at the label and it's not even dairy and gluten-free. <laughs> this was after I already ate it. And the thing is, I'm not allergic, but I could have been. You know, just, I could have been. Just last week, I wasn't greeted when I walked through the doors, walked into church. We, we started worshiping and I looked at the screen. I, I couldn't read the words. The, the text was too small. Like, I've got, I'm not perfect 2020. One of my eyes is, I, it, I got a headache. I came to worship and it's just not possible. How am I supposed to worship if I can't even read the words on the screen? So his sermon goes long. All my friends are already at Applebee's. All the appetizers are gone. I missed the kickoff. <laughs> they want me to pay full price for my entree? Okay, so just so we're clear, that, that wasn't real persecution, okay? Everyone's aware of that. That's not real persecution. Now, that's oftentimes how we react, though, isn't it? I, I think as Americans... You know, there's something really cool about being American because just a part of our DNA is this, you know, champion of, you know, freedom and liberty. Like, that's just who we are. That's what we do, right? I mean, we are free and we have liberties. And the problem is there's pros and there's cons to this. The con is that oftentimes when those liberties, when those freedoms seem to be attacked or maybe being taken away, we do one of two things. We get really, really big or we get really, really small. Right? You get really, really big and you flex and you say, how dare you? And you get really angry and everyone knows how angry you are. Or you get really, really small and you're just like, oh, God, where are you? Why are you not doing that? I'm in the... And we just get really, really small. And I think what the Apostle Paul here is saying in this verse is, you know what? What you need to do is not get really big. You don't need to get really, really small. You simply need to learn how to endure and endure well. And when you endure and you endure well, you're actually going to reflect that same quality that Jesus lived out on the cross when he endured the cross. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to talk to individuals from countries like we just watched and hear the testimonies of actual, real, violent persecution. If you've ever had an opportunity to talk with these folks, there is something about their deep connection with God, you can see that that persecution has actually allowed their roots to grow so much deeper. Uh, there is this sense where you almost look at where they're at with their relationship with God, their dependence on God, and it's as though they have an advantage that you and I don't. That somehow that persecution has left us at a disadvantage and them at an advantage. I mean, think about even just how the church has grown throughout the history. Most of the time, when church is growing, when the global church is on the move, it's usually right in the middle of persecution. There's something that takes us deeper with God and a deeper um, dependency on Him. So what does this look like for us? How can we begin to endure and endure well? Let me, let me share a principle with you. It's a principle that I'm sure you've seen. Maybe you haven't actually had words quite like this to describe it, but it's a principle that you've probably seen in action, and here it is. When family identity is strong, like peer pressure and, and temptation is low. Let me say that again. When family identity is strong, peer pressure, temptation is low. On the other hand, when family identity is weak, peer pressure is really, really strong. H have you ever seen that principle play itself out? Like if you're a family and you get together and you say, hey, we have a mission, we have a purpose, this is who we are, this is what we do, the temptations of this world can come crashing against your family and it still hurts and there's still pain and there's still difficulty, but those waves come crashing on the foundation of Christ and you're left standing. However, when family identity is weak, those same pressures those same temptations come crashing on your family and you will see your family drifting to all kinds of temptations and all kinds of, of things that really just draw them further away from God. 
And, and so how are we going to get to a point where we have a strong family identity so that those temptations and those uh, peer pressures aren't as strong? I think it begins with just starting to talk about your identity. You, you know, one of the things that we've said over and over again in this series is to be a Christ-centered family. And, and so if nothing else, I would say, how about, how about just using that language in your family as often as you can? So as a family, maybe you're, you know, talking about decisions and you just say the words, hey, you know what, because we're a Christ-centered family, how about we, how about we do this this weekend? And, and, and hey, you know what, because we're a Christ-centered family, how about we don't do this? And my goodness, the other day, wow, we really got made fun of, didn't we? But that's okay, that's okay, because we are a what? We are a Christ-centered family. And so when you have that identity, and maybe you have other language that you want to use, and maybe you want to come up with a purpose statement for your family, but when family identity is strong, guys, you're able to endure even when those waves crash against the foundation of what God has built on your life. All right, number three, number three suggestion. Teach our families. We're going to teach our families to pursue God for, uh, excuse me, pursue God for let me read that one more time. I'm having a real hard time when it comes to reading today. Teach your families to praise, to praise God for persecution. Have you guys ever gone into a life group and maybe the facilitator has said something like, hey, uh, you got any prayer requests or praises? You guys ever had that experience? Okay, most of you have. I know like one hand went up and it was my wife because I think she felt bad for me. But you guys have all probably had that experience. Now, when, when your facilitator says, hey, you got any prayer requests, praises, have you ever heard someone like talk about the praises of, yeah, yeah, um, you know, Joe who works next to me in accounting. Yeah, he hates my guts because I love Jesus, but I, and it's just awesome. I love it. It's so good. Like, have you ever heard that? No. Like when you share praises, it's I prayed and God answered my prayer. Praise God. You know, I, God's actually moving in these really amazing ways, and everything that I want is happening. Praise God. Like, that's what we praise God for. And then when it comes to the requests, what do we ask for God when it comes to requests? Things are miserable. Things are awful. Like, Joe in accounting, he hates my guts. You know, help me, help me, right? That's what we do. But according to Scripture, according to Jesus' own words, when you're going through persecution, this is actually a time to praise God. And so we're going to teach our families, this is what we're going to do. This is going to be the texture. This is going to be the pattern of our lives. I want to point out how uh, Peter, the apostle, says this. We already read Jesus talking about it, but Peter, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, he's writing to a church that is going through extreme persecution, like levels that we saw in the video. What we see is Peter talking to a church where it was not uncommon for Christians to be arrested, to be beaten, and in some occasions actually tied up, wrapped in animal skin, placed in an arena, and wild dogs loosed on them, and them being devoured alive. Like, that's, that's some hardcore persecution. I mean, if that happened today, and, and if that actually got out, I mean, that would go viral, and people would be up in arms. This, this happened on a regular basis. So what does he say to that church? He says, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. He's like, hey, this is what's going to happen. We, we, we told you, the fine print, what is it? You will actually experience persecution. So when that persecution comes, verse 13, rejoice. Rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the suffering of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Drop down to verse 16. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Why would we praise God when we're going through suffering because of our righteousness? Because that's what Jesus did for you. Jesus suffered for you, and when you get to actually step in and participate in just a small way of his great love, suffering on the cross for you, it is demonstrating to you your love and your commitment to him. And we should actually have these moments. Maybe we're praying in public and it's, it's for our meal and it's silent, but our heads are bowed and someone walks by and makes a little comment. In that middle of that prayer, just say, God, thank you for that. Thank you just for reminding me of what your son Jesus did and I can have just a small taste of that too. And when you make decisions as a family and as a parent and other families and other parents think you're super weird and that's really odd, you just say, God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you that we're different. Because what I see around the world, I mean, we want to be different. We want to be different. So thank you. Thank you for that. Just make those moments, moments where you praise. Uh, 
a while ago, I was on the back porch with my family, and I don't know how the conversation got to this, but I started sharing with my, my boys some of the difficulties that I've had in my Christian walk because of prioritizing holiness and righteousness uh, and working in the church and some of the struggles that have come with that. And so I'm telling them these stories, and my boys love me. And so as I'm sharing these things, they just felt this sense of injustice. What? You had to go through what? They did what? I can't believe it. And so their sense of justice like, ah, oh, we would definitely not let that happen. It's like, boys, it happened a while ago. It's good. Like, God is good. It's okay. Um, and I went to bed that night feeling loved, but at the same time feeling as though maybe I didn't communicate the right story. And so the next day or the day after, I got together with the boys, and I told them a different story. I told them about this uh, time I went to Santa Cruz, which is a beach town in, uh, in California, with a friend. And so I'm in college, and it's February, really cold. No one's swimming because it's, it's really cold, but I didn't care. I jumped in the ocean anyway, and my friend is up on uh, the shore, and she's reading a book. And, uh, and so I'm splashing around, and I get caught in, like, the worst riptide I have ever experienced. I mean, I, I'm pretty experienced when it comes to the ocean. I, f- I feel like I know what to do and what not to do. But I got caught in one of these nasty riptides, and I'm being dragged out. And my friend doesn't seem to care at all. She's just dialed into her book. No one else is on the beach. It's cold, right? And I'm just getting hit wave after wave after wave, and I'm trying to do everything I'm supposed to do, and I'm just getting further and further out. And I have this panic moment of, is this, is this the end? Like, is this, is this how I'm going to die? I'm like, no, I am going to fight this. And so I just swim as best I can. And for minutes on end, I, I feel like I'm just going to drown. And then finally, my big toe, just like a tiny bit of my big toe, touches some sand. And I'm like, I'm going to dig that thing in as much as I can to get as much leverage. And then I get hit with another wave. And it's like, ah. And then I get a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. Finally, I get to the shore. And I'm exhausted. And I'm worn out. And I fall down. I'm like, I almost died. I almost died, right? And then I look at my boys. And there was a little bit more to the story. But I was like, yeah, pretty intense, right? And they're like, yeah, that was super intense, Dad. I'm glad you're OK. And then I asked them, so do you think that because of my bad experience in the ocean, do you think I've given up on the ocean? And they're like, they know me, they know me. So they've got big smiles. I'm like, not a chance. Like, no, of course not. You love the ocean. And I said, the other day, I told you some stories of some difficulty that I've had because of wanting to live a holy life for Christ, to be Christ-centered. And I talked to you about some waves, and I've talked to you, I talked to you about some difficulties that I went through. Understand, boys, we don't give up on Christ just because things get difficult. We don't give up on the church just because we get hit, just because we get bruised, just because we get battered and beaten a little bit. We don't give up on Christ. We don't give up on the church. Why? Because we are a Christ-centered family. And I want that same message to be heard by all of you. There are going to be times where you're going to experience persecution because of your choice to be Christ-centered. Don't be surprised when it happens. Don't be worried. Don't be concerned. In fact, I would go as far as to say, don't be concerned when persecution enters your life. If you need to be concerned about something, maybe be concerned when persecution isn't a part of your life, because that might indicate that you are drifting towards being a Christian family, but maybe not being a Christ-centered family. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your son Jesus and the sacrifice that he made. When we think about the cross, genuinely think about the cross, it's so hard for us to imagine that, that you, God, would do something for us when we consistently are rebellious. Father, but when we get to show our dedication and our, our choice to honor you through, through the sacrifice of things that we love for who you are, who we love even more, Father, we get a taste of what your son Jesus went through. And Father, I pray that we would just have joy in those moments. And that we would continue to reflect you and reflect you well. I pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.